Our problem it. is we were thinking about meat and gravy, and we just got sidetracked. <laughs> Welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Chowhound and with me today, because I gave him lots of meat to eat, is my good friend Manny Cruz, the Toonie Tenor. Say hi. What? No gravy? So yeah, I forgot the gravy again and I know you're starving too. So... <laughs> <laughs> but make sure it's like the really good gravy, not like the one they have at KFC here in the States. It's just pretty much brown water. It's not gravy. How is the KFC over in Australia? It's a magical thing here, and I'm genuinely curious now to try the gravy in the US just so I can tell you whether it's the same <laughs> or not, and it probably isn't. But we're not here to talk about gravy while well, we kind of are, but you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, <these> gravy talk. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, as mentioned, this is Chowhound, released on the 10th of June, 1951. It had a Blue Ribbon reissue sometime in 1960. It's the 623rd in the series and it's directed by who else? Chuck Jones or Charles M. Jones, as according to the credits here. Still, it's on two releases. So it's on the Looney Tunes Golden Collection Volume 6 DVD set and it's also in the Looney Tunes Platinum Collection Volume 1 Blu ray set. And I wish there was an audio commentary there by Eric Goldberg, because apparently this is his favorite cartoon. So, yeah, there you go. And sadly, yes, I can't show you the full thing here due to copyright on YouTube, but essentially a dog has a captive cat that he makes to go get meat for him but hey it's not enough so he plans to get a lot of money in order to buy more meat with the gravy that's right that's right <laughs> yes and uh, the ending which we'll discuss shortly he certainly gets the gravy <laughs> <laughs> in terms of trivia there's actually really not much there's only really one major one here unless you count the music trivia which we'll discuss as well later on but some of the names referenced in the ads are animator lloyd vaughn ken harris cm jones and we even get termite terrace address which i believe by this point they weren't actually at termite terrace anymore they're all we're animating on the studio a lot now. Yeah, by this point, I think they left Termite Terrace, and I know someone's going to scream at me in the comments. It's been a while, but I believe that they left sometime in probably the 30s, late 30s, when I think everybody was united on one main lot. I just don't remember off the top of my head, but technically Termite Terrace was just referring to the Avery unit. Avery is the director, Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett, Sid Sutherland, and Virgil Ross as the animators. That was the original Termite Terrace because they were in that ramshackle shack all off the main Warner Brothers studio a lot. But now we use that term to talk about the entire studio output from the 30s to the 60s. And I've seen some people online like, they, you know, they get pretty heated about it. Like, oh, you're not supposed to use... Like for me, if someone says Termite Terrace, I'm thinking the original shorts from the 30s to the 60s. Yes, technically it means something else. So it's just a matter of semantics at this point. Yes, it's just a basically, a, I guess, a collective grouping, if you will, of what we refer to as... Yeah, the Looney Tunes studio, I guess. It's that, that's probably one way to put it. But let's have a chat about this particular short, which i got to say, and I'm sure you agree with me here, it's one of the darkest Looney Tunes ever made. Oh, yeah. It's been a while since I've seen this one. They did play this on Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon back in the day. I really didn't remember much of it besides, you know, the dog who's being voiced by John T. Smith always saying, What? No gravy? What? No gravy? What? No gravy? Anyway, you forgot the gravy again. And at the very end of the cartoon, there's just something about the way Mel Blanc delivers that line when the dog gets his comeuppance and he goes, This time we didn't forget the gravy. Yes. I love the way he says gravy at the yes. very end. And it's just rewatching it now after many years later as an adult, I'm like, this is a great cartoon. But man, is it dark. And it's just like, it's giving me vibes of Fresh Air, Dale. And what you said prior to the recording, this is also giving you vibes of One Froggy Evening. Just Chuck Jones really digging into in the darker parts of humanity. Just exploitation, abuse, gluttony, all those different things. But done in a cute little cartoon. <laughs> exactly right. And you mentioned One Froggy Evening. It's interesting because this is basically a very simple story and it's shades of what Jones and Maltese would do later on with One Froggy Evening where you've got basically a 
greedy main character who would end up getting what's coming to him at the end. That mustached man ends up losing his money and his home and everything. So it's still pretty dark. But here, well, we got a nice gluttonous ending. It reminds me of the movie Seven, actually, which is pretty horrific in the beginning. But anyway, <laughs> you mentioned John T. Smith. This is probably my favorite of all of his vocal roles that he did in Looney Tunes during his brief time of, I think, about three years or so. It's just perfect. I can't think of anyone, and not even Mel Blanc, doing that voice. It is so good. And I should mention, thanks to Keith Scott's book, he also does the voice of the zookeeper. Here, saber tooth, kitty, kitty, kitty. Here, Sabertooth. Sure, he also had a pretty good range, too, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I forgot to grab the book before the recording. But I was thinking to myself, I'm like, who does the voice of the zookeeper? John T. Smith, his dog voice, I instantly knew it. But, yeah, I should have looked that up. But uh, thank you again, Keith, for your wonderful book that is in another part of my house and I was too lazy to get. But, yeah, he's got some range. I'm genuinely surprised. Yeah, because he was also one of the, you know, hillbillies in Hillbilly Hair. And, yeah, he's done, done quite quite a bit and then he just pretty much disappeared off the face of the earth that's and he's got one of those generic names where it's like yeah i'm sure there's no other john smiths out there at all you know neither in history nor in society today <laughs> and of course oh, you know where i'm yeah. going with this <laughs> yes john smith 1882 my mistake yep simpsons reference my of mistake <laughs> exactly uh, i can't help my i'm telling you folks it's either a blessing or a disease that I could quote The Simpsons for nearly everything. <laughs> of course. <laughs> exactly. Uh, just for completeness sake, uh, Keith also confirms that it is indeed Bea Benedict that does all the women's voices. And, you know, even without the book, you can pretty much tell. I mean, if you're a Flintstones fanatic like I am, you can tell Bea. She's pretty easy to spot when it comes to voices. So going through the cartoon itself before this really dark ending, there's one bit that I was thinking did they record something or did they forget to record something so you see the dog's mouth move like he's saying something but there's no dialogue to it no that i didn't notice but speaking of like a weird recording thing i think it was a way that i'm not a recording engineer i don't know the, the specifics of it but when you see the establishing shot of the zoo and you know you hear the music playing you hear of congo of course i love that particular music cue like you hear the sounds of like the animals or i, I think it was like the animals in the background but it's just the way that it was mixed it sounded a little weird to me I don't know, something about the mixing of that particular track. Like you hear animals or something going on, but it sounds either very distant or very, I don't know, it came across weird to me. And now you mentioned this word, like the dog is talking. Now I'm going to go into another, but it reminds me of the first season of the original Ninja Turtles series where they had a lot of moments like that, where you see the characters not move their mouth, but you hear their voices. And there was a ton of animation mistakes in it. I'm thinking of the Popeye cartoons from the 30s, you know, the Fleischer ones where they would add additional dialogue, ADR of, you know, Jack Mercer improvising as Popeye. And it was intentional that his mouth was not moving. And those are honestly some of the funniest moments in all the Popeye cartoons, all the ad libs that him and May Questel and, and Gus Wick would add in those cartoons. But this one, they fell asleep behind the wheel a little bit. But I mean, it's not a huge deal. Like I said, I didn't even notice it until you brought it up. I love the anime of the dog I has that little book he's just flipping through oh his thumb. you read my mind that little that little red book like he's flipping through it you know those those little black books that you would use in school it had like the spotty black cover oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, now i know which ones yeah yeah, yeah yeah composition books and i remember that they had the really small ones that you know they gave them out you know for like a party or whatever they gave them out in school just for the heck of it and that little book that's what it reminded me of just like a little composition book where you know you'd write your notes in or whatever all your phone numbers and addresses down in a little tiny book exactly i lo love those little touches that chuck jones always seems to put in his cartoons just like that silly touch where there's a saber tooth catechus and somehow you got a zoo expert who should be fired from his job because he <laughs> can't see he's a cat with fake fangs and of course later on he sees what i'm assuming is like a african hunter type that the, the dog appears as and he's just got this stupid red mustache <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, that's the sort of thing that doesn't, I guess, get a big rise out of me as a kid, but as an adult, I'm looking at how ridiculous that is. And it's like, 
oh yeah, you're clearly on the level here. You know, maybe that was the basis for Doctor Robotnik's mustache right there. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> who, who knows? Know. Now this is quite a bit of music in here and as you already mentioned Congo and I personally could hear Malway baby face when the cat is you know has the bow tie put on him uh, and of course when the dog gets the money what do we hear I'm set for life I'll never be hungry again da, 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 da. And we're in the money by Al Dubin and Harry Warren because we've never heard that one before in a Warner exactly. Brothers it's very <laughs> unique for this short very unique <laughs> Very, absolutely. Never never happened before, never again. So what other songs do we hear in this short? So the opening titles starts off with It's a Great Feeling. Then I look in the cue sheet, I was like, oh, you sly devil, Carl Stalling, you with your irony. Of course, you know, in the beginning of the cartoon, you hear uh, da 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 meow, meow. Why, Butch, finished that big steak already? And I must say, I really like that green sweater he has on. Also, the fact that the cat had green eyes, and I thought that was a nice little touch. You also hear three little kittens, a little bit of Johannes Brahms' cradle song. I like the theme song of the old man. Hey, uh, Timothy, uh, you know, whatever the heck you said in it. But uh, you hear Arkansas Traveler, which, mwah, chef's kiss. Oh, it's you, Timothy. I see you caught another mouse, I see. You caught. Well, come on. You earned your keep. You earned it. I thought it was really funny to put that particular song. You hear a little bit of good old Joaquino Rossini with the overture to William Tell, the dawn section. Here, a little shameless plug. I was on the This Means podcast not that long ago with Jonathan Graves, so go check that out. And I talk about the William Tell overture in particular, how it's technically like the overtures are pretty much chunks of the music that you're going to hear in the production up ahead. Because when I say William Tell overture, everybody thinks at the ending, you know, but it's actually other pieces of it like you know da, 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 da. that's part of the overture or the da, 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 you know whenever you see a storm in a, in a cartoon that's also part of the william tell overture but anyway enough of rossini we again nobody that you'll ever hear again in cartoons congo which again I, it's one of my personal favorite musical cues and it was also featured in the scene where the dog with the dr robotnik mustache and the mouse who is a stereotypical african native and again i used to watch this on nickelodeon i'm pretty sure i never saw that scene on nickelodeon as a kid and it used to be on cartoon network but it was cut out in viewings understandably so we're in the money as you mentioned hickory dickory doc i love hearing am i blue near the end of the cartoon am i blue doo, doo, doo. and in an absolute Absolute brilliant use of music in my humble opinion at the very end of the cartoon when the dog just gives into his gluttony when the cat and the mouse are there to you know give him the gravy you hear when the swallows come back to capistrano playing in the background and i just thought that it was <laughs> no. just i started cracking up at the end it's like swallows come back to, you know coming back home but then in my head the phrase the chickens have come home to roost popped in my head. And I'm like, the ultimate form of revenge. And deservedly so, because, you know, there's some Chuck Jones cartoons where, you know, these characters are put through the ringer. But I think for this one, it was so satisfying to see that. And this is coming from a guy who has a dog, so I'm biased. But just having the cat and the mouse get their revenge in that way. And the fact that you hear this beautiful music playing while they're drowning this dog in gravy. And even worse is there's no punchline. I mean, that, that is a punchline, I should say. But you hear the classic Mel Blanc gargle, and then it, the cartoon ends. And it's like, oh, like, they're not even making a silly comment or, you know, a silly cutaway. It's like, no, it's like, that's it. He's left to his fate. And that's really dark. And the music is a nice touch there. Of course. And, so, and of course, Swallow, and he's swallowing the gravy. So that oh, works. See, I didn't even think of that. I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I'm getting all deep get, doing a doctoral thesis like, oh, swallows a bird. He's swallowing gravy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, yeah, good yeah. Me. There we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, with John T. Smith's voice, i got to say the other voice I love in this, the Mel Blanc did because he does a lot of the uh, other male voices, is the old man. I mean, it's just every time I hear it and my kids are watching with me, because, yes, I subject my kids to dark cartoons like this, of course. But <laughs> I, I, I just love the whole thing. He's like, oh, Timothy Morgan. Like, that's that weird little tick. Like, that Morgan, Morgan. Yeah, I yeah. Really I forgot about I love that tick he does. 
<laughs> it's just uh, whoa, Timothy, and even the animation. Just he's definitely getting on in years. How he's shaking his legs as he's getting up off the bed. You know, like I said, Chuck Jones likes to put a lot of uh, those little touches in his shorts, which I think is fantastic. And and of course, uh, I love that mouse where he's like standing up for himself, but clearly, of course, he's no match for the dog. And <laughs> you know, you know, why'd you pick on some? You know. But anyway, um, I love that little... The mouse does a few good lines, but my personal favorite... How mortifying. How mortifying when he's dressed up as a native. I do get a kick out of that line. But in particular, my favorite is... I think a nap will do me a world of good. Amen, brother. Exactly. And now he's my good friend, John, giving his thoughts on this short. So take it away, John. Well, back again, and I'm going that I'm here recording for this cartoon, Channel Hound, directed by the great Chuck Jones, and it's one of his one to wonder. So first thing for all, involving about how, when was the first time I ever watched this cartoon? The first time I ever knew about the existence of this short was not in the form of standalone, but from a Warner Brothers movie. If you watch the Room and Bird video I mentioned the Cats and Dog movie where the sequel had Room and Bird footage in it, well the first one has Chow Hound in it and that was the way I was introduced to the cartoon. Years later when I began revisiting the old Looney Tunes shorts and watching some for the first time, I watched Chow Hound and I really enjoyed it for two reasons. One, the humor and two, the ending, which I'm gonna talk at much later. So first of all, I think plot-wise this is, you know, some a little bit simple but still enjoyable. This cartoon has to have one of the darkest endings for uh, Warner Brothers short. And yeah, it's a little bit twisted and dark, but hey, it's one of the reasons I remember this cartoon. Another thing is the character design. I really like what Jones and his team did for the character designs, especially for the cat and the dog. The cat one remembers me a little bit of Quad Cat, but yeah, I really like the green eyes. Make him a little bit more unique than other feline characters at the time. Then the dog does remind me a lot of Charlie Dog, but well, it's a little bit different. I would like to say that this is this is Charlie Dog after hitting the gym. Okay, now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room when it comes to this cartoon. And it's a small scene featured during the sequence that when they are going to the zoo. And is the worst part in the cartoon. In it, we see the dog, the cat, and the mouse in disguises. The dog is in a hunter disguise, and the mouse is in an African native costume. And obviously, this is the one thing of the cartoon that has aged poorly, and it's obviously the, the worst scene of this cartoon. It obviously is no longer acceptable in nowadays standards, and when shown on television, this scene will be mostly cut. But yeah. I don't like this scene. So the last thing I want to add involving this cartoon, overall, this is one of the funniest Jones shorts of the 1950s. You know, by this time, Chuck Jones had finally achieved his own comedy, his signature style. And yeah, this short is an example. It's also weirdly that year's only one-shot short to not be a Robert McKimson cartoon. Because in 1951, most of the one-shot cartoons are by McKimson, and Jones only made one. Overall, I really enjoyed this short. And another thing I remember about this cartoon is, is some clips of it being featured on a Chuck Jones documentary. Uh, Eric Gober, who is a famous Disney animator known for his work on some movies, most not as we Aladdin, for animating the genie, did talk a little bit about this cartoon in a Chuck Jones documentary. And he mentioned that the this time we ain't forget about the gravy being, you know, an iconic quote that he will even say in dinner. I think it was like that in the documentary. I haven't checked it out. But yeah, it's another reason I remember this short. Chow Hound is pretty funny cartoon. It's obviously one of Jones great, but at the same time there are a little bit of better entries on Jones filmography, but this one is obviously among the, the best. And that's all my part that I have, and I'll see you in the next review. Now as for reviewing this short, this one is a what I call a dark masterpiece. It's 9.5 out of 10. It is just perfect from start to finish. Wonderful animation. Great voice work, especially by John T. Smith here, who basically steals the show away from Mel Blanc, who also does a, a magnificent job along with Bia Benaderet. And we've got the classic catchphrase that seemingly everyone uses now, which of course is, What? No gravy? That's my impersonation Not there. Bad. <laughs> I was originally going to give it a nine, but after talking about it and, you know, hearing your rating and just for the sake of consistency, I'm not going to put it at a 10, but it's pretty close So 9.5. This cartoon, if I remember correctly, is on the 100 greatest Looney Tunes list and deservedly so. You said it's a dark masterpiece. Off the top of my head, some of the darkest cartoons I could think of. 
you know, this one, Case of the Stuttering Pig, Bye Bye Bluebeard, Fishtails. My personal favorite of all those is, I've said it before, Case of the Stuttering Pig. But this is arguably the best dark cartoon they've ever made. Yeah, I think a runner-up would be the Hypochondry Cat. I think that's another one that Chuck did. Mm -hmm. uh, be similar. But to those of you watching, I do have a question. I, I do want you to comment below. Is there someone in your family that still, to this day, that might be of the older generation, but anyway, who says that, that catchphrase, what? No gravy? Okay, <laughs> I, I, I want to know, okay? Definitely let me know because I, I have an uncle who always says that. So we seemingly all have someone that says, you know, the what no gravy line. So I definitely want to know. But I, I know you always say it, Manny, don't you? Like you always at... Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> having your brown water or water at uh, KFC, you know, <laughs> give me gravy there. But anyway, anyway, we'll wrap it up here before it turns into gravy talk. So thanks so much for watching, guys. And until next time, don't forget the gravy and this time we didn't forget the ending no 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 no